vertical organization of production, and the agrarian economy. Hello. In this presentation, we're going to take a look at the way Andean civilizations organized their economic production. This was based on the fact that they were occupying different areas along a continuum that moved from one altitude level to another, from the western slope that ended at the Pacific Ocean all the way through the eastern slope, which ended at the Amazon, Amazon basin, the Amazon savanna. Ecological diversity had a fundamental role in Andean economy. The contiguity of different altitude zones should be evident in this picture to the left, where you can see the Amazon uh, basin, you can see the, the rainforest, and in the background, you could see how the Andes, different sets, uh, different, different mountains, different elevations, start moving towards the west zone, gaining altitude. This means that there is a clear connection between different zones, and that was heavily used by the Andean population from times which preceded Hispanic uh, invasion by perhaps a thousand of years. An important fact about Andean civilizations is, is that they had a very large population. If we compare the population of Andean civilizations around the 16th century when the Spanish invasion took place, the, the, amount, of, the amount of people living in, those, uh, in, in Mexico or Peru were not much different from the amount of people living in, in France or Spain or Italy. To achieve a population of millions of people, between 10 to 12 million according to some estimates, you must have mastered economic production. You must have mastered a very efficient system of, eco of production of food because after you, after you can satisfy the most basic need of the population for eating, then they can thrive and they could create temples, they could create any type of like big massive construction, roads, etc. The key to do that was to control a diverse and interconnected territory. How interconnected was, uh, can, can that territory be? Not all of the Andes are equal, and we talked about that before. So in some way, for instance, when you have uh, lower altitude uh, Andes, lower altitude mountains, when you have narrower mountains, that allows for that, uh, that allows for a more for an easier connection between the western side and the eastern side. To be even more precise in this, uh, you could have uh, you can have coasts like the Ecuadorian one, where the tropical weather is clearly in effect. You have higher humidity and you can have more production in that area. And that area connects more quickly with altitudes which are not that high. And that, and since, it's, since it is also a narrower section of the Andes, you can access the Eastern slope, the Amazon region more quickly. So what that means is that not all the Andes are, not all the Andean sections are equal and some of them have the possibility, some civilizations have the possibility of expanding their control contiguously throughout more connected, more interconnected zones. On the other hand, a very on the other hand, the Andes in the southern in the southern the southern Andes in Peru and in Bolivia, they have a, a very different geography, which demands a different type of control to achieve productivity. This means that if you want to start a state in that area of the Andes, the Peruvian Andes, the Bolivian Andes, then states, civilizations or states, they need to look more like this, like archipelagos. An archipelago is a set of islands. They form a set, but they are not contiguous to each other. They have, as you can see in the picture, space between each other. The main example here is going to be the uh, civilizations who, which develop in the Altiplano, the high Andean plateau, the area of the Titicaca Lake. So we're talking about 12,467 feet where the Titicaca Lake is located. And that area is very much uh, suited for the production of tubers, particularly potato, but other tubers too, oca, masua, for instance. But also uh, it allows for big extension of grazing fields. And that means that the indigenous population living there was famous for 
well, they were considered wealthy, wealthy Indians, according to the uh, Spanish chroniclers in the 16th, 17th century, because they own a lot of uh, a, lo a lot of cattle, a lot of uh, alpaca and llama herds. A state like the Lupaca, one of the ethnic groups of the, the Koya people, speakers of Aymara, that state, that small kingdom, had a population of around 100,000 people. And the capital of this, of this state was in the Chiquito town, right next on the shores of the Titicaca Lake. Even though they were living there, it was well known due to um, documentation in the colonial times that the lords, like the, the nobility for, for, from these Lupaca people, they had control over land, which was two days, six, six days, or even 10 days away from the Chukwito location. That means that in, you know, in the, in the larger scheme of things, a distance of up to 10 days was not that uh, dramatic in terms of how it was going to affect the possibility of, of commerce or trade or moving products, uh, products from one point to the other. So that was fairly common during, these, during the pre-Hispanic period. The main uh, way of transportation was large, very big uh, llama herds composed of hundreds, if not, you know, hundreds and hundreds of these animals that were crossing the Andes east and west. So these people from the Lupaca, uh, the Lupaca state were capable, they had colonies in some way, they had encl enclaves, which allowed them to access produ products produce which was not available at the high altitude plateau. So in other regions, they were able to cultivate coca, which was very important for ritual and to keep people working as a stimulant. And also they could obtain fruit, corn, which was very much appreciated, and other type of product, another type of crops. And this terrain, as I mentioned, was going all the way into the Pacific Ocean, where they were able also to get uh, fertilizer the famous one from the islands in the Pacific of Peru and Chile. Then these states, in this particular case, the Lupaque state, as a representation of other states in the, in the Andes before the Inca time even, even, they had to exert control over all the possible productive zones in the Andes, throughout the Andes, and they needed to organize this in an organized, they needed to organize this in an articulated economic system. This is extremely pressing for the survival of people if you take into consideration that only 2 to 3% of the land in the Peruvian and Bolivian Andes is cultivable, is arable. So that means that if you want to get production, if you, went, if you want to maximize your production in terms of diversity and how you can feed a large amount of population, then you need to come up with a different system and that is called the, con the vertical control of different ecological zones at altitude points. This can be best appreciated in the following, um, the following graphic. Here you can see how the different altitude zones are characterized by different products, by different products. The Pacific Ocean, of course, allows, an, uh, allows people living there fishermen and also people who can uh, extract this fertilizer, this natural fertilizer, the guano, which is the, um, the, uh, what, the production, which is accumulated bird excrement who has been left out to dry out because, and because of the lack of rain, it can accumulate without being washed away by the rain. The temperate valley produces cotton and corn the highland produces potato and quinoa also, the plateau llamas and alpacas, and the Amazon Piedmont yuca, coca leaves, and other type of fruit. Coca can also be produced on the lower western slopes, by the way. So it's not that it just grows on the, on the Amazonian part of the Andes. There is a clear contrast between the European and Andean organization for economics. To begin with, the territory in a European society, a, a, a typical European state, a kingdom, let's call it like that, is to begin with a territory with a continuous extension. The change for that was the, uh, the colonial times. Colonial regimes, they developed this continuous system of, uh, this continuous system that had a metropolis 
and then other uh, regions which were under their control, which specialized in the extraction of very specific um, raw materials, minerals, agricultural products, sugar, that were commodities that these uh, colonial powers could trade with other, with other colonial powers. This type of trade was not exactly what happened in the in the Andean in Andean societies. What they were trying to do, what they were doing, was exerting control throughout different different regions, which were not that far away. After all, we're talking comparing, you know, like the European metropoli, the typical European metropoli was not a few days walking distance. It was months through, you know, months uh, navigating across the ocean. So this is a very, very important difference. What the Andean civilization, what Andean states were trying to do, or were effectively doing, was expanding their chances of obtaining product, products by occupying different islands, like niche, in different altitude, altitude zones. And in order to do that, the Aili organization, the community, the Andean community, was ve a very, very important uh, element of this type of organization because because you could have that one ILU had a specialized productive uh, role so, so they, they were specializing in producing or raising certain um, certain cattle or getting certain certain potatoes or doing cotton and not exactly all the time because I don't want you to think that this happened you know as this ILU only produces this not that was not the case, but they could produce more of something than the other, which characterized them in terms of how they were trading. This is particularly true for certain ILUs, which were more um, herders than um, than peasants working the land. The this the different type the different ILUs, which were working and producing different types of uh, of things, they were organized and they reported to a centralized power. You can see here how these, uh, the Lupaca people, here is Chukwito, the capital, were one of the ethnic groups of the Aymara people living around the Titicaca Lake. Like each one of these, the Colias, the, the Orcosulio, the Pacajes, Orcosulio, the Pacajes of Masuyu, they were considered different ethnic groups. The Lupacas in this uh, in this graphic, you could see how even though they were at more than 12,000 feet around the Titicaca Lake, they were controlling different areas here at different elevations next to certain rivers. That is vertical control of an archipelago of productive uh, areas. The different islands that were under the control of a centralized power they included diverse identities and they had to coexist in the same state. So the way in which this worked was that political unity was negotiated with the ILU leader. We talk about hierarchies within the ILU and part of these hierarchies, uh, this, oh, sorry, these hierarchies were enforced or were uh, encouraged by the possibility of a centralized power to give gifts to give other type of, of benefits to those who were in power and control the redistribution of whatever was produced in the ILU. So in few words, people in this state, in the in this city, let's put it like that, in the Chukwito city, they had to keep the Kuraka, the head, the chief of the ILU, they could, had to keep the Kuraka happy. And through that type of retribution, through that kind of, kind of reciprocity, the central power gave something to the Kuraka and the Kuraka was able to reciprocate, giving back the excedent, the surplus that was, uh, cre that was created by the work of the people in the community. And also the Kuraka of all of these colonies, as put it out, those en enclaves, was also um, bound to reciprocate to the people working for him. So pretty much it was a continuous uh, interaction between working people in the community, the hierarchy within the community, within the ILU, and then other ILUs and the central power that kept control of all of these 
communities scattered ar across different altitude zones. So the coexistence of Andean states uh, implied self-sufficiency. Every state existing there could, impart, could very specifically be defined by its capability of survive on its own. And that happened only because they could control different, different, different zones with different, um, with yielded different crops. So this mosaic of this continuously owned land uh, created certain restrictions in the way those states interacted with each other. There was war. Absolutely. But war was in more than one way expensive to afford because the people who were fighting the wars would have been the people working on the crops. So having wars prevented, there were, there were no professional armies, which is another important uh, characteristic of this Andean civilization. So if you wanted to fight, every, every soldier was also, uh, was also a peasant. So it was also a farmer. You couldn't you couldn't have them work fighting all the time. So for that reason, you had to apply also reciprocity rule between states, between civilizations, and that was a fundamental rule. If you were going to have your um, your llama herd moving your product from your one of your islands down, you know the vertical axis of the Andes, it it was impossible to go from that place to the main capital without going through a, through another through the territory of another civilization or another state so in that sense you had to let the you had to if you want your own your herd to take things to your place you had to lead, you you had to to let others do the same and that is basic reciprocity too and uh, another way in which this reciprocity or this connection was enforced was by um, by creating the idea that even though we are different, we still have some things that we have in common. So if polytheism was the norm in Andean societies, so that means that you had the chance of including the god of your neighbor as part of your pantheon, part of the, your collection of gods that you offers uh, rights or or you pay or you pay your duties so in that way you can you can get a type you can get some type of, of connection between people that will create certain sense of, of connection and the necessity of giving preference to those who are in some way closer to you Another important element was multilingualism multilingualism was the norm for Andean civilization for, for Andean civilizations before the arrival of, this, of the Spaniards. And the way in which this uh, makes sense is that if civilizations had to have different, um, different, different um, enclaves at different altitude zones, it is possible that one enclave was speaking one language because of the, the people who were moved to colonize that part and they were neighboring other people who were living there before who spoke a different language. So what you had was Connection between communities, between ILUs, as, and we know that sometimes or many times you have to go outside of your ILU to get married or you have, and then, and then means that your kids are going to have somebody in the family speaking in one language and then you're going to have somebody speaking in another language. So multilingualism becomes the norm. So if states become self-sufficient through the control of different ecological zones, that means that exchange in this view of Andean economy becomes a peripheral activity is less important. We know that people did, um, did trade and bartering is still very much present in, in common everyday life in the Andes. However, the, the lack of this intense trade among communities or at a state level where you have to get your goods to have certain particular value Val, uh, certain particular value that could allow for extended trade across boundaries, the lack of that explains very well why there is there is no, there is no money or there was no money for doing any any type of trade in Andean civilizations. 
So trading in some trading effectively seems to uh, seems to be less important than self sufficiency of these states, these Andean states. So the the function of bartering becomes restrict, heavily restricted, of mainly restricted to family oriented economics. In a nutshell. Uh, the model of Andean economic, the economics that we're taking a look, that we're looking at, has was developed by the anthrop famous Andean anthropologist John Victor Mura. He was born in Ukraine, a very distinguished scholar who changed the perspective on Andean history throughout uh, his long career. Uh, this quote from Burren, 1996, is a summary of the of Mura's perspective. The vertical archipelago model, which is rooted in an appreciation of the distinctive nature of Andean geography, which means let's pay attention to the material constraints that shape the way culture is in the Andes. This emphasizes the direct control of resources by a particular community or ethnic group. Mora and others have stressed that this type of economic organization is related to a cultural idea of community self-sufficiency that is ancient, pre-Hispanic, pre-Incan, and pan-Andean, at least in all the areas where the control of contiguous land is difficult. So what we have seen here is that the control has the, the, the vertical control allows self-sufficiency of a state, and that creates a state of equilibrium where people don't need to be fighting with each other because we all have what we need. If we all reciprocate, we can get together, we can get along just fine, and this can allow for the growth of a civilization with more and more complexity because the basic necessities are already covered by the system. Unfortunately, this uh, way of doing economics was severely uh, changed and it was fractured when the Europeans came into, uh, into the stage in, in Peru, in the Andes, in Bolivia, and Ecuador. What we can see here is that the first major change that took place 40 years, more than 40 years after the, the conquest of Peru was the creation of reductions. Reductions were towns, towns in Spanish matter. And this is important to understand because the way in which the uh, Andean towns existed, the Ailu, as you, as you must know now, was very much uh, a scattered collection of houses and people who were living far away from each other because each one was tending their own land and then they had to come together for communal work. But for them, doing things with one, two, three days of you know distance walking was not a problem. That was the way in which economic was, uh, was, was carried out to control a larger amount of territory. So this was unthinkable for the Spaniards because they came from a different society and they wanted a different type of economic production. They wanted to extract mineral and they wanted to produce very particular, very specific type of crops. So they had to take the indigenous people, they had to take Andean people, and forcefully they reducted them. They, that's why they are called reductions, reducciones. They had to put them together in the same place so that they could live, they could, they could be taken control more easily. The, goal, the, the first goal was to Christianize them, then to tax them, and finally to control them for whatever they can produce and, and also to contribute workforce for mineral extraction and the production of textiles, which was another very important economic production, uh, productive activity during the colonial times. So the emphasis was given by the Spaniards on mining and forced labor. This is quite different from what we had in the vertical archipelago. We had people working on different areas and then going from one place to another and then trading at a very small, um, at a more restricted level, just to keep a goal of self sustainability instead of having massive extraction of some type of, of good that is considered, uh, that is capable of producing wealth by trade, which is capitalist system. 
Then another problem was the decimation of the population through diseases and abusive labor. They were forced to go into the mine and the mine pretty much killed the population. We were mentioning that by the time the Spaniards arrived, we had uh, in 1532, there were 10 to 12 million people in the Andes, in the, in the throughout the extension of the former Inca Empire, by 1669-1670, that amount of population was reduced to 1.5 to 2 million people. Another problem that this, the fracture of the vertical archipelago system brought was that people were not cultivating, they were not getting food in the same manner they were doing before. So that reduced the diversity of what they were eating and that impoverished their health also. Spaniards came with their own habits and they wanted to have more wheat, for instance. The cultivation, the grow of wheat was something that was fairly alien to the indigenous people. Even today, Peru has to import wheat because we consume a lot of bread and pasta. But that is, as you can see, uh, a habit that came with the European uh, people who colonized Peru. And this effectively changed for the worse the healthy lifestyle lifestyle that the Andean population had before this, before the invasion. To conclude, there is some criticism to the idea of the vertical archipelago. So it is an idea that is widely accepted by anthropologists, historians, sociologists working in the Andean area. However, particularly the southern area uh, region. However, there is still some criticisms that can be can be made uh, to the to John Murrah's theory. The first criticism is that the uh, the vertical archipelago serve a purpose similar to those in other colonial states. So the exploitation of enclaves was done to benefit an elite and not to guarantee the self-sufficiency of the people. So what we're talking about here is changing these uh, perspective where, okay, we want the elite wants to control this just to make things well distributed and to have harmony among all the people working, working in the state or living in this state. So that perspective might not be true. And in the end, what these people were doing, the elite was, we want to have things that are better and we want to have, uh, we want to have the possibility of redistribute these things to other people working in other, you know, to the to the hierarchical elite in the Ailus. So in the end, wanting to control all of these coca and getting more, uh, I don't know, getting more wool to make textiles, all of those things were not in the interest of the majority, but in the interest of the elite. Also, the theory of Mura, the theory of the vertical archipelago, puts a lot of emphasis on environmental determinism. Only if most of everyone benefits from access to diverse products at a large scale, then we can assume that, a, that vertical control was the economic, was the basic economic system in a state. So that means we cannot presuppose that the, the presence of different islands of, or colonies from a state equals to, oh, they had this type of vertical organization type of style economics. It can also be the fact, uh, it could be that not most of the population benefits from that. And finally, barter and exchange was, per, was more likely, most likely a central subsistence strategy that pre-existed uh, the state-based economics that according to Mura was expressed in this vertical control. So, which means, well, Maybe the Ailus were, produ were producing and people were producing different things and they were living at different places. And then they had to come down, you know, or go up and start, you know, trading whatever they didn't have. Yes, that is a possibility and it can be seen. It is not unusual to still see this, this type of uh, big barter market in different Andean communities. However, we need to realize that this type of... Uh, that this type of bartering may be the result of the fracture of the traditional Andean economics under the colonial regime. And what we're seeing is people in more reduced communities, which are not organized at a larger, at the larger level of a state, trying to survive. So that's why they are trading more often than not. And we also need to remember that the ILU was 
all the the ILU also extended throughout different uh, vertical zones, perhaps not as dramatically as the Lupaca people in Mura's famous example that we examined before. But in any case, they also had control over different levels, different altitude altitude level, different ecological zones, which means that perhaps trade was more an interfamiliar affair.